in order for that to work, the processors need to be able to communicate between them. And for that to be efficient, then the compute has to take longer than the communication. So as it gets very complex, we have these very difficult networks. And we need to be able to pass messages between them all um, so that the problem can be split up and then brought together again with the solution. But of course, one of the problems at the moment is although computers are getting bigger and bigger, they're getting more and more difficult to program. So, so there's a huge gap there. Software is, is where the future is, and that's why we need lots of clever people coming in on the IT side of things to help us to work, out, work on the programs for that. Because at the moment, the overhead of, of moving data between the different processes is dominant. We need new languages, new approaches, new ways of doing things. So lots of people like you. That's the problem there. So you can see that, that sometimes um, the curves, sometimes you actually get slower. The bigger computer you run on, the slower your problem runs. There's also a, a, a couple of different ways of approaching things. Um, we have high performance computing driven problems where you start with a question, you have a theory, you're looking for to do simulation and modeling to back that up and find out what the possible answers could be. So that's a more traditional way of using supercomputers but there's also problems which are driven by big data where you have large amounts of data and you're interested in putting it all together and using the computer to explore that to come up with new insights. Um, so in, in both of these, I think it's important to have different groups of people doing the research because perhaps women are interested in different questions, women are interested in different challenges. So having a much more diverse body of people trying to do scientific research or industrial research will benefit society. So I first started to think about this. Um, I went to an event organized by the Partnership for Advanced Computing in Europe, of which I used to be the chair of the board of directors, um, which was entitled Supercomputing for All in 2013. Now, if you look at this picture, you can see that all is interpreted quite narrowly. So of the people that were at the meeting, um, there were six women. One of the women was the meeting secretary. Um, so, so there were five women there representing the 24 countries or their technical advisors. So at that stage, you know, it, it was obvious that if we were really to represent the whole of Europe and to move forward, we did need some more women involved in it. But the lack of women in computing, as has been mentioned, is a relatively recent phenomenon. Um, Ada Lovelace first computer scientist. What many of you may not know that originally computer was a job title and it was a job title that initially was given to women, particularly started off during the war when men were away fighting and, and the women were left behind and one of the most important technical role for women, particularly ones who were good at maths, was to work on code breaking and communications so they could support the war effort. So in those days, all computers, just about all computers, were women, and they had a really important role. But of course, things changed. Another famous woman was Grace Hopper, who has a big conference series in the States called after her. Um, so she was an admiral in America, worked on, on computing during the war, and invented COBOL, which is one of the most famous uh, programming languages used in business. So, where and why did it all go wrong? So, you know, as has been mentioned, it's a well-paid job. It's, it's got a huge range of, of different type, job types that you could do. You have to keep learning all the time because the technology is changing, so, so it's never boring. And a lot, most roles, particularly things like programming, are ideally suited for part-time work or for people who want to move countries because, you know, there's nothing that says that any project has to be done by one person working on it for 12 months. Um, no matter how much, how convenient that would seem. So, so in the face of it, it seems a really good job for women. So why are there so few women working in it? So it's about, as far as we're aware, it's about 25% of people working in, in IT are women. Um, the proportion in high performance computing is lower than that. So we think it's about one in eight. Um, I have really mainly, mainly have statistics from the UK, um, but the gender gap in students 
in all STEM courses seems to be widening. Um, the biggest gaps in computer science where there are f even fewer women coming through than five years ago. So we have to do something different, think about the problem a different way, or find some, some ways of tackling it. So particularly, why do we think there are so few women in computing? Well, some of it's the culture, um, that, that in, particularly in some, in some companies or some organization, you know, there's this view you have to be really geeky, um, you have to be really technology focused, um, it's not really fun, you have to go in at eight o'clock in the morning and be there till midnight. Um, and not everybody wants that, particularly if they're thinking about a work-life balance. Some organizations are not particularly family friendly, so women perhaps start, but they drop out and they go on to do something else. And as we've said, there's far fewer girls studying uh, maths, computer science, etc. And nowadays, most industries are not prepared to train people up, and they're increasingly looking for people with relevant degrees. So at this point, I should say, my younger daughter has a degree in Russian, and she is just today completing her master's course in software engineering. So she's done a conversion master's. She's moved over. There's 100 people in her course. Um, she's got really good marks in the programming. So I do not, I think that society should be doing more there. I don't think it's just about taking people who've had a lifelong interest in STEM. I think if you're interested in technology and keen to learn new things, you can move over. But that's my personal opinion. So one of the things we decided to do in the UK um, was, was to look at, at men and women working in supercomputing to see if there were some answers there, to see if there were, were some, some gender differences. So you have to remember, these are all women and men who are currently working in high performance computing in the UK. So as we thought, five times more men than women. But of the women working there, far fewer of them had experienced programming at school. So they were probably less likely to come into it. So whatever you can do, I think, to encourage um, your younger sisters or your cousins, um, your friends, your daughters, to take part in things like code clubs is going to be important. Of the women, more than half of them had no experience of high performance computing until they became postgraduates. And some of them had no experience of HPC until they, were, they became postdoctoral researchers. So women tend to be tend to be exposed to high performance computing at a later stage than men. And then we did find that, that there was some evidence of boy, girls, boy jobs and girls jobs, that women thought even more than men that the ability to write good code was important for them to get on in their jobs, but far more women didn't like writing code. Um, Nobody was really very keen on software engineering. I think people liked writing, who liked writing code liked writing it, but they weren't particularly keen in making it uh, manageable and supportable. But one of the, the things that I think concerned me is, is that, that women tended to be doing things like setting up the jobs and running the application. So men wrote the code, women ran the jobs, the results came back, and men gave writing the papers, which are the way the traditionally in academia that you'll get on most in your career, that was the highest priority. Um, that was the highest priority for men and the second to last highest priority for women. So, so I th it, it looked as if there, you know, men wrote the code, men wrote the papers, women did the sort of the supporting bit in between. So that looked like something we have to be able to try and change. In terms of looking at, at why diversity matters, I think, as has been said earlier, it matters partly because we know that mixed teams have best results. But also, I think, because women tend to study different subjects or have different interests, they are going to do different, different research. Um, so, so the reason I have a pink phone here is I think when my daughters were growing up, whoever was designing products for women had this view that a woman's product was something that was bright pink and slightly smaller than a conventional one. So that's a man's idea of what a woman wants. But, you know, wh when I looked at, at the sort of research that was being done in Ford, and admittedly this is not all on the IT side, the sorts of things that they have panels that are looking at is, you know, how easy is it to get into the car if you're wearing high heels and a skirt? Um, are you going to scratch it if you've got rings? Um, do the buttons work with your long fingernails? 
but you know, with the last one, I don't have long fingernails, but 30 years ago, I can remember when I was an operating system, um, so I was putting together operating systems, we were doing one of the first touch screens, and it had been through unit test, all the tests, it had only ever been tested by men. So the product's about to go out the door, and I said, oh, this looks interesting, can I have a shot of your touch screen? And it didn't work with my nails. They said to me, it must just be your fingers. So I said, no. <laughs> so quickly they had to phone somebody. It was a Saturday evening. It was that close to, to deadline. The guy who lived nearest, his girlfriend came, and guess what? It didn't work with her either. So, so that's an example of how if you don't have a diverse team, you don't design it with thinking about the whole of society, you are going to have problems. So one of the other things I've noticed, and I think this, this cartoon sums it up well, is if you are the only person in your field that is a woman, then people are going to generalize from you. So, you know, if you're not, this one, if you're not good at maths and you're a man, people will just say, oh, you know, Robert's not good at maths. But if you're the only woman they know working in the area, they'll point to you and, and they'll generalize. They'll say, all women are not good at this. So I think that's one of the reasons why it's important to try and diversify, to work with other people of the same gender, so that you, know, you can be an individual, you can, you can stand or fail, you can be good at the things you're good at, bad at the things you're bad at, without you somehow being held up as an example of an entire gender. So within, within the Praise Project, um, after, after the experience of seeing that um, there were only a few women working in it, we, we decided to do two things. So the first thing was to, to produce a magazine um, which, which had examples of all the different sorts of jobs in high performance computing being undertaken by women. Um, and instead of having a glossy cover with, with lots of you know, esoteric computing pictures, I thought it would be nice to get people to send in selfies. So these are all women working in high performance computing in Europe, there's, there's lots more on the back page, taken by themselves and sent in so you can see it. So that was the first publication. The second one we did was, was to produce a digest. Was, there's, there's a regular series of, of science digests on projects undertaken on the large supercomputers in Europe. So rather than go through the traditional thing, which is, oh, we're going to highlight eight projects, oh, for gender equality, we ought to have one by a woman, we thought it would be nice to have a whole issue which was exactly the same as another issue but all the projects in it just happened to be done by women scientists. So I was trying to get away from this idea, you know, mother of, mother, clever mother of two, isn't she doing really well holding down a scientific job whilst uh, producing good research, which you tend to get in, in some of the newspapers or some of the coverage. So what we did, uh, I say, was this, was this publication which was purely scientific, but was just about women. Now, nobody would have batted an eyelid if it had been just about men. But one of the interesting things there when we looked at it was the types of projects that women were doing and the areas they were working in were subtly different from the areas that men were working in. There were more wor women working in environmental science. There were, obviously, there were more women working in biology. So from that, you know, that made me realize that perhaps if we had a more equal gender bi bias working in HPC, then the sorts of societal problems that we'd be working on would be different. I mean, there's obviously nothing wrong with people um, wanting to work in particle physics, but particle physics is very heavily dominated by men. Um, so if more women were confident about HPC, then we'd have a different balance of research in Europe. So this kind of illustrates where we are. So this is the usage of the big supercomputers in Europe, the, the Prace computers, of which the one in Barcelona here is one. So you'll see particle physics dominates the sorts of areas where women tend to work more life sciences, earth and climate sciences, um, and to a certain extent astronomy and cosmology. There's a much smaller percentage of the projects being done in these areas, but if we have a more equal gender bias, um, then these areas will be growing. So it's going to move on just to say a little bit about um, my own center and the sorts of things we're doing there. Um, so, so you can see what's happening in the UK. Um, so I, I manage a center which builds on a long tradition of high performance computing, but which particularly is looking at industry problems. So it's funded by the government following a report which says the UK could become much more productive 
if there was much better investment and usage by companies in using the latest technology, in particular high performance computing to do modeling and simulation. The next stage of that was uh, we've got additional money to focus on data centric computing, so that's solving the prob data centered problems using large, large computers. And we also now have a partnership with IBM who base about uh, 20 going up to 30 researchers in our center working with our staff. So we, we have a pur particular purpose um, to lead UK research into industrial applications of high performance computing and by that to drive economic development, to take, take the combined research capacity not just of academics but also of some of the, the big vendors. At the moment it's, it's IBM and it's going to be Atos Bull because we've just got one of their new computers. Um, to work with, with companies to make them self-sufficient, to help train up their staff so that once they stop working with us, they can continue working by themselves. It's obviously to get the most out of the, the large investment the government's made in us and to try and support the northwest of England, um, known as the Northern Powerhouse, as a regional center for scientific and economic development. And in common with many countries, um, a lot of the, the wealth in the UK is centered around London, so there's a number of regional activities um, to try and support other parts of the country, and, and this is one of the ones. So this is just uh, explaining, this is just the, the glossy slide which explains what we do. Um, so it's taking things from research through to prototyping, through to deployment, better products and services. Now, I put this slide in, so, so this is a traditional slide, but you can see that um, whoever put together our traditional slide was thinking that the things that we were doing would be quite engineering-based and, and, and quite male-based. Um, so, so the first one is, is efficient vacuum cleaners, but it's done in a way you know, which is really about the engineering challenges. Whole engine modeling for aircraft, that's obviously important. Um, and then a lot of the design about making, this is Bentley cars, so high-end cars, uh, making them then better and faster. However, we have, we have a whole range of different types of projects. So, so perhaps if we're wanting to appeal to more women, um, then we need to emphasize some of the different types of projects we do. But as I say at the moment, because all the companies we work with, um, the big companies are run by men, their engineering departments are run by men, their product development departments are run by men, then we perhaps don't have as much scope for emphasizing some of the different types of projects. Essentially, though, what we're trying to do is we, we're looking for challenges which sit at the intersection between the more traditional modeling and simulation, data analytics, and machine learning. So the idea there is if we can bring machine learning into some of these complex industrial problems, then that's the best way of achieving huge productivity gains. So an example of one of the things we're trying to do, um, obviously rather than building larger and larger supercomputers all the time and working on energy efficiency, if you can cut down the number of computations that you actually have to do by being cleverer about the, perim the perimeters, parameters that you're selecting for your simulations, then you can save a lot of energy through not running particular jobs. So, so a lot of the work is on things like, like workflows, you know, what can you learn from the jobs you've already run that help you to direct the next jobs that you're going to run on the computers. So that's one area of research. Um, there's, there's a lot of work being going on, going on in, in the formulation industry because for bench chemists, it takes a long time to mix up different compounds. You then have to wait perhaps for, for six weeks to see if they disintegrate. You know, if, you, if you're developing things like new shampoos or body washes or whatever, you have to be sure that they're quite stable. So lots of the work for that is being done online. So the example here is uh, on lubricants, where if you can make engines more efficient, you can save a lot of money. But one of the other areas where this is being applied is in the formulation of, of shampoos and body washes, particularly for use in third world countries or, or countries where there may be water shortages. So you want to be able to enable people to keep clean and to wash their clothes and to use as little water as possible so you can increase hygiene and health benefits. 
So that, you know, that's an example where perhaps, again, if you're trying to ap appeal to wider sections of society, that's the kind of example you should be using rather than <laughs> lubricating lorries. It, it's all the same technology, but there's different ways and different examples, different ways of, of presenting it. So effectively what we're doing is we're taking a highly skilled workforce, IT people like you, using the power of, of the really big computers and trying to see what economic impact we can get. We need a lot of different types of, of IT expertise. Much of it's about making, for industry, is about making systems easy to use. One of the objectives is, uh, can we have jobs run on the supercomputer that are sent from an iPad? So that, you know, if, if you're sat in your office, you're a chemist, you don't really care about computers, um, you want to be able to send the job, go off for a cup of coffee, come back and get your results. Well, we can't quite do it that quickly, but that's what we're working towards, to make things as easy as, as complex, as easy as possible, hide the complexity. Now, if this works, one, one of our, our, our biggest and best projects is we're working with a children's hospital in the Liverpool area. It's, it's a new hospital, and the idea is if you can, can work with patients as much as possible before they come into the hospital, you can maximize the time that doctors have to spend with them discussing medical issues, and you, know, you, you, can, you can calm the patients down, you can provide them with information, about how to get to the hospital, about what their treatment's going to be, um, and enhance the whole patient experience. So it's about educating patients, about monitoring their stress levels beforehand, um, and then about providing data back there, which allows the hospital to improve the way it does things.
Thank you. That's all I'm going to say. Um, I hope it's given you some insights into the types of things we can do um, and encourage some of you to think more about uh, move working in high-performance computing or high-performance data analytics or cognitive computing. So, thank you very much. Has anybody got any questions before we go for coffees or a break? So before we go out, for the break to see the posters and uh, have a chance to talk to the wonderful role models who are here with us as our speakers today. I have three things to tell you. First of all, the evaluations are very valuable for us and they help us to improve women courage for the future. Please fill in the evaluation forms and hand them in. Second, uh, we have some t-shirts that can be bought from the registration system. I would like to tell you that. Plus, we are looking for one scholarship student who didn't show up, uh, didn't see our scholarships chair. Ishari Amarasinghe. Please find Ruth and sign in your uh, attendance. Thank you very much. Let's have coffee. <laughs>